It is 3.06 on a very warm Tuesday afternoon. The Vince Colonnese Show. Vince still in sick bay, but getting better every day. Mike Opelka is my name. Honored, thrilled, really happy to be here. But I have to tell you, after watching Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. deliver his big announcement on the executive order that's going to And I'm using those air quotes with my fingers. Close the border. It's hard to wake up. I just poured myself a cup of really stout tea with extra caffeine and theanine because it sharpens your mind. I was watching Biden live thinking, is he is he reading this for the first time? Because it really felt like that. You know, they have the little setting there with the American flags and some governors, bipartisan governors, he wanted us to know. You'd think that if it was truly bipartisan, especially dealing with the southern border, that Greg Abbott would be there. That's not happening because this deal, this executive order is Bravo Sierra. It is a load of fertilize. The end of it was really kind of telling. And I'm not sure if this is going to be loud enough because the AP feed I was watching was a little a little weak. So let, let me see if I could torque it up a little bit. This is the very end of it. Let's fix the problem and stop fighting about it. I'm doing my part. We're doing our part. Congressional Republicans should do their part. Thank you very much. And then, of course, he folds the notebook closed. Stares blankly, tries to figure out which way he's supposed to go. Doesn't answer any questions. Mouths a few things. Waves. And then shuffles off. Oh, there's a there's a question. I asked her, is Prime Minister Netanyahu playing politics with the war? I don't think so. He's trying to work out a serious problem again. And that's all we got. That's all we got out of the President of the United States. And then he's gone. And then it's over. Well, nothing really got solved today. Nothing. Not not at this point, anyway. (sighs) The comments are very interesting. If you watch something like this on YouTube and the live comments that are just rolling by. That was on top of, that was after today's hearing with uh, Merrick Garland in the House, which we'll get into that. Boy, oh boy, what a day. So Biden comes up with a confusing executive order that doesn't appear to be going to solve anything. At least not that I could figure out. Listen, if if you heard some brilliant plan in that uh, address today, you are welcome to share your knowledge, but I'm listening to it and I think, okay, this is A, not really sealing the border. And if you're closing the barn door, it's after all the bad stuff has come in. If you think you're protecting us with the millions and millions of people already here and so many of them, we don't even know if 1% of these people are bad people. We are booed, screwed, and tattooed. I think that's the government expression. But you're welcome to share it at 888-630-9625. Asylum, though, apparently essentially still available to uh, the thousands and thousands of illegals every day uh, here in the country that are released through the uh, CBP-1 app. Today I'm announcing actions to bar migrants who cross our southern border unlawfully from receiving asylum. Migrants will be restricted from receiving asylum at our southern border unless they seek it after entering through an established lawful process. And those who seek to come to the United States legally, for example, by making an appointment and coming to a port of entry, asylum will still be available to them. Still available. Hello, United States of America. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to cross the border. Uh, Let me see, what day were you thinking? It's so frustrating. 
so very frustrating. And imagine how frustrating it is to the cities where the people in those cities are seeing their tax dollars supporting folks who are here illegally who have come here in the past three and a half years who have flooded our country, straining the resources of education, of support for folks who are trying to deal with the effects of Bidenflation. Imagine how those people feel. He didn't really stop the flow or promise to get rid of the folks who are here illegally. No. Donald Trump has promised that, by the way. He has promised that. He said, I'll, I'll fix this. We'll, we'll, we'll straighten this out. Just really irritating. We do have uh, some folks we're going to discuss this with uh, later today. About halfway through the show today, Jenny Tare, who's um, started, I think, at the Daily Caller, and then she moved to the New York Post, has done amazing work reporting from the border. And she'll get she'll get into it with us. And Mark Morgan, who was the former acting commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection under Donald Trump. And he's a visiting fellow over at Heritage as well. And we still have more to discuss about Dr. Fauci's testimony yesterday. And as I said, we have to get into some of the stuff that was said in the uh, the Mayor Garland hearing. Oh, my God. My head hurts. Really, I came out of the Merrick Garland hearing waiting for the Biden announcement, and I've already got a a headache from that. And then Sleepy Joe, and I know that's a Trump phrase, but I think it's it's appropriate here. Sleepy Joe stands up there. It really sounded like that was the first time he had read that. It really, you can randomly drop into this, and it sounds like he's, he hasn't had the uh, Red Bull Prevagen kick in yet. You know, that cocktail that he gets. He came out, you'd think he'd come out being at least presidential. It just sounds tired. Let me, let me give you a sample. The very beginning, Joe Biden coming out there. Here he is. Good afternoon. I've come here today to do what the Republicans in Congress refuse to do. Take the necessary steps to secure our border. Well, that's really not true. And I, if, if this were Donald Trump and the fact checkers who chased him every day saying he's lying. If that were Donald Trump saying, uh, good afternoon, I've come here today to do what the Democrats in Congress refuse to do. And that is uh, fix the border problem or address the border issue. Uh, the, Donald Trump would be said to be lying. And I think it's fair that the shuffler in chief get the same treatment. But I dream. That's not going to happen. Donald Trump did a preemptive strike before this happened today. Mr. Trump uh, decided to put a little video earlier, and I have uh, the opening of it for you. I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's three minutes long. But uh, I do think it is fair and honest. And here's the Trump announcement. Crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of our country by far, has totally surrendered our southern border. His weakness and extremism have resulted in a border invasion like we have never seen before. Other countries have emptied out their prisons, insane asylums, and mental institutions and sent us drug dealers, human traffickers, and terrorists. Millions of people have poured into our country, and now, after nearly four years of his failed, weak leadership, pathetic leadership, crooked Joe Biden is pretending to finally do something about the border. But in fact, it's all about show because he knows we have a debate coming up in three weeks. The truth is that Joe Biden's executive order won't stop the invasion. It's weak and it's pathetic. It will actually make the invasion worse. I don't think he's wrong. I don't think he's wrong about that because you know there will be a certain rush to get to the border ahead of a lot of these things coming to fruition. There will be a push, as always happens. There's said to be a push of more people coming to the borders because they believe Donald Trump will return and they want to get in before the doors are closed. Hmm. We shall see. Senator Kennedy, a few senators were uh, addressing this before Joe Biden came out today as well. Senator John Kennedy, who I just think is uh, delightful. And always spends time making sure he has the right message. Okay, I want you to listen up. Here's the, here's the drill. 
Uh, President Biden is in trouble politically. Um, he's polling right up there with fungal infections. Part of the reason for that is that he gave in to the loon wing of his party and he dissolved the southern border. Now, five months before an election, he has to appear to be willing to do something about it. Hence this executive order. I think Senator Kennedy first should apologize to fungal infections. I really think that's appropriate, you know, to take to take that kind of a tone with the fungal infections. They really deserve an apology. They really shouldn't be compared or said to be polling on the same level as Joe Biden. But he gets this right, that this is all about election politics. This is all about 153 days from today. And Donald Trump said it as well. Donald Trump said this is about the debate in three weeks. But I seriously wonder if Joe Biden is going to debate. I seriously wonder if he's going to make it or if he's going to say, I won't debate a convicted felon. I really don't think the Biden campaign wants to be on a debate stage with Donald Trump in a live situation because they all know that in 2016, when Donald Trump was on a stage with Hillary Clinton, he was he was sharp as a razor. And Hillary was no slouch. You know, Hillary could handle herself, but she couldn't handle Trump. Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, one of those surprise moments that I'm sure plays over and over again in the Biden campaign when they're saying, should we debate Trump? Should we debate Trump? And somebody goes, I don't know, 2016, Hillary. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Because you'd be in jail. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> yeah. That's what would happen, although there won't be a, uh, a live audience in studio for that one. That's a, the Biden campaign has already managed that. We're not going to have a live audience. And they also apparently have got an agreement that says that they will turn off the other person's microphone when one of the candidates is speaking. That's another indication <laughs> that the Biden camp has figured it out and they're freaking out. Freaking out bigly. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. I see the, the calls are lining up here, so we're going to get on the calls. Uh, let's take a, a break a little bit early. We'll come back and hit some of the calls early. It is 324 on this beautiful, warm Tuesday. Mike Opelka in for Vince Colonnese on WMAL. And we were just discussing Joe Biden's executive order that really isn't going to fix the border problem he created and could have fixed after the 94 executive actions he took when he took office over three and a half years, or just about three and a half years ago, if we want to be technical about it. Many of you weighing in already on the phones, which is a great thing. 888-630-9625 is the number. Let's check in with Chris and Marshall. Hello, Chris. Welcome. Michael, stunt brain, my favorite number two. Of course, I'm calling from the front of the heartland, my friend. Oh, I really enjoy hearing you on the radio, but I do look forward to uh, to Vince, and I wish him all the best. Listen, this thing with Biden right now, it reminds me of a joke I heard years ago. Okay. Guy, is meet, guy meets this girl in a bar, and they're chatting it up and having a great time, and he looks at her frankly, and he says, would you have sex with me for a million dollars? And she tilts her head and says, yeah, okay, sure. And he says, okay, how about 50 bucks? And she recoils and says, what do you think I am? And he says, we've already determined what you are. Now we're just debating your value. Why 4,400 people a day? Why not four? Why not close the border, period? Yeah, why not Why not uh, 999 when Jay Johnson said 1,000 was a crisis back under Barack Obama? 1,000 was a crisis for the country. And Joe Biden wants more than four times that. You're right, Chris. Uh, well, we know who he Demography is. Demography is destiny. Demography is destiny. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. This is uh, 
This is something that was noticed uh, over a decade ago by a group in Texas called the Testudo Project. And the Testudo Project noticed the Democrats were trying to flip red states blue by bringing in as many people from Central America and from Mexico as possible. And uh, Catherine Engelbrecht, the same lady who was behind the uh, 2000 Mules, I think that's it. Wasn't that the name of that film that showed the, uh, yeah. the, the voting? Yeah, she was one of yes. the people behind it. And Testudo is one of the Testudo project back then was a quiet project. Uh, but I adopted that word. It's an old Roman word. It was a maneuver in wartime when when the soldiers would yell Testudo, they would all put their shields over their heads and get close together to protect from incoming fire, spears and arrows, etc. And that's my yes, take sir. on what we need to do. So, yeah, good, do good joke. Know? Sad speaking one. Of, speaking of projects, have you heard about the Remembrance Project, another another project from down on the border? I suggest people look that up, the Remembrance Project. It's dedicated to all of the Americans that have, have lost their lives at the hands of illegals in our country. The well Remembrance done, Chris. Project. Well done, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate that. I got to rock Thanks, and roll. Man. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Got a, he's got a lot of energy for this point in the afternoon, especially after listening to Biden. Let's do we have time to squeeze one more in? If we do, let's get Kevin from Manassas. Kevin, you got about 30 seconds. Go. Well, let me get to it then, Mike. Uh, that nice to talk to you again. Look, the Democrats, Joe Biden, I can hear the talking points now. Oh, Biden secured the border going up four months before the election. Well, you know, unlike Joe Biden, I was raised in the black of community. Uh, shout out to Oxon Hill High School, PG County. I did grow up in the African-American community. And I remember the Democrats come in every four years, used to promise the African-American people everything. They don't see him again until the next election. So is this what they're doing? Do they think we're yes. stupid? Yes, they do. They do. And it's, it's on us to wake up. It's Michael Pelka and for Vince Colonnais on WMAL. It is a warm Tuesday afternoon in Washington, D.C. Mike Opelka, that's me, sitting in for Vince Colonnais on the Vince Colonnais show. Yesterday, we gave you all the details, and they're all up, posted on Twitter. You can hear Corey explain it yesterday. Get well quickly, Vince, and completely. That's the big news. Many stories going today. We're trying to see if there's anything happening in the Hunter Biden trial. In Delaware, Wilmington, not far from where I sit in my little studio. I guess it's just as expected. Otherwise, they'd be breaking in. We talked briefly about Joe Biden's executive order that he says is going to fix the border. <laughs> it's not. It's not. He's putting a Band-Aid on, uh, on a wound that requires a tourniquet right now. Seriously. We'll get into that. We have to pause that for a moment. Yesterday, we were in uh, deep discussions over Dr. Anthony Fauci and his testimony in the hearing and, and with Jim Jordan and with James Comer and, and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene getting particularly uh, animated, as it were, saying that Fauci deserved to be imprisoned. And I don't disagree with her. Sometimes I disagree with her methods, but I don't disagree with her. And uh, I want to continue that discussion as well because we had access to Dr. Stephen Quay, uh, the man who wrote a book called Stay Safe, A Physician's Guide to uh, Survive Coronavirus. Um, Dr. Quay, you and I haven't talked before, but I'm really interested to hear your take on uh, Dr. Fauci and his presentation yesterday. What was your takeaway? <laughs> Good. Great, great to speak to you, Mike. Well, you know, I guess if I had one word, it would be disappointing. If I had two, it would be hugely disappointing. Um, the setup to it was that he, he we had we had Peter Daszak from EcoHealth Alliance, who'd been funding a lab in China where the virus came from, and then we had David Morins, who was uh, Anthony Fauci's uh, assistant for you know, almost three decades, and those two men spoke about the three-way conversations that were occurring from, let's say, January of 2020 through, through July of 2020, where the three of them were concocting methods to suppress the, uh, the, the understanding that this came from a laboratory. 
Um, and now we know that they were doing that. So the anticipation was that Dr. Dr. Fauci would be asked about his end of these three-way conversations. Uh, and basically what he did is he threw, he threw both gentlemen under the bus. Uh, he sat there and, and, and sort of, you know, was a Teflon, a Teflon character, which was, for me, very disappointing. I think disappointing is an understatement for me, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to think yourself. Uh, doctor, when we go through this, Basically, a lot of us believe the lab leak was the was the real truth. And a lot of us who mentioned that we thought the lab leak was the reality were shouted down or shut down or silenced in some way, shape or form, shadow banned on social media sources. And uh, and now that it's generally accepted, I'm I'm wondering, um, did you experience that same kind of thinking? Were you an early adopter of the thinking that this was man-made, engineered by humans? Well, sure, yeah. In, in May of 2020, um, I, I wrote a paper on what, what inside the gene of the virus said that it was that it came from a laboratory. There's almost a confessional uh, from the from the virus itself. Um, and I actually worked with uh, President Trump's State Department in the fall, uh, and until he you know he, he handed over the, the keys to the White House in in January of 2021, uh, I worked with them on uh, identifying what sources proved that it came from a laboratory. So uh, I was very early on in that, and and yes, it was it was very difficult as a scientist watching other scientists simply take clear evidence and their twenty years of experience, and then just talk out of the other side of their mouth. Yeah, thank you for saying talk out of the other side of their mouth. I was thinking about a yard south, but that's me. Uh, where where is the medical community now? There was a a rift in many parts of the medical community during the pandemic and during all of this as it relates to vaccinations, boosting, masks, social distancing, it, would you have any handle on the uh, the overriding feeling of, of doctors like yourself in terms of uh, uh, did we feel that we got hoodwinked? Are we owed an apology or, or do we just say we didn't know enough and let's move on? No, that's absolutely wrong. We knew exactly what the right things were due, and we made decisions that went against all of the established principles uh, that masks don't work, that social distancing is not going to work. Um, and it was in it for me as a physician. The, the, you know, I, I don't want to get too emotional here, but there, there, it's almost a sacred relationship between a doctor and a patient, and, and, and the two of them are the ones that should be deciding health care. It should not be coming from Washington. It should not be you know, being dictated to us, and all of that was taken away with this emergency authorization of powers uh, for public health I I groups that you know they shouldn't have had, and we, we need to be very careful about the next time we pull the switch to say this is an emergency and we need to override all of the individual principles and rights that have been going you know, for two 2000 years the physician has been the, the one taking care of the patient not you know not the, the roman uh, emperor yeah i i hope that's what happens i hope there's a return but now we have this fear that bird flu which is kind of out there it's not really picking up momentum but we keep hearing little flashpoints of bird flu in farms in michigan and places in oklahoma and in iowa and that there's a possibility this bird flu could adapt and jump human to human and then we'd have another another epidemic not necessarily pandemic but an epidemic of bird flu and they're worried that it would be particularly deadly if it's human to human and i think the relationship the trust relationship between average joe and the medical industry especially big pharma has really been taking a hit um is there are you concerned about bird flu and do you think that there is uh, the same deficit in trust that I'm seeing? Well, first of all, let's, let's you know deal with the most important thing for your listeners, which is I have studied uh, what's going on with the, the you know the two cases that are that I'm familiar with of the of the jump of the bird flu. I see no evidence that this has the capabilities to become human to human transmitted. Um, so at this point in time, uh, you know I see we should just not think about that at all. And if that changes, I'd love to come back on and explain why it changed for me, and then and then tell you what to do about it. But in terms of trust, absolutely, of course we. I mean, 
I have invented seven drugs that are approved by the FDA. I know what that process looks like. And when, and when we did the process for the mRNA uh, the, uh, vaccines, the technology, uh, look, we didn't do it as we didn't do it as thoroughly as you would do it if you could. But we were trying to get something done quickly. But we very quickly also had signals of heart damage in teenage boys, especially these sorts of things. And we didn't respond to additional scientific and medical signals that should have told us to pause should have told us to never vaccinate, you know, people under 10. Uh, lots lots of sig- scientific medical signals were coming out, and they were ignored in this overriding, uh, I don't know the motivation, so I don't want to get there, but overriding uh, emphasis to just, we're, we're going to vaccinate everybody, we're going to tell people what to do, they're going to do what we tell them, or we're going to put them in jail, or we're going to take their licenses away, or we do all these sorts of things. So um, that needs to never happen again, and, and we need to figure out how to be stronger in being able to communicate um, where they've crossed the line and, and what you can do about it when they do that. Yeah, fear is a really powerful element in, in changing people's behaviors. And we certainly saw that on display in the earliest days of the pandemic when there were a lot of people dying. And maybe those people were dying because that they were uh, immunocompromised, whether it was their general health, their age, their weight, uh, made them susceptible to something like this novel coronavirus. I don't know. Uh, Here's a question for you, Dr. Stephen Quay, who's talking with us today. Um, Now that we're basically through it, not that COVID isn't still out there. I have one of my golf buddies got COVID two weeks ago and I went, wait, I thought we were done with that. There are discussions about whether or not our bodies will eliminate the mRNA vaccines uh, or is that something that we need to uh, change our diet to, in order to get that out, are we forever stuck with these mRNA vaccines inside of us? No, I don't believe we are. They were designed to last longer than a typical messenger RNA. So messenger RNAs are the blueprints. You know, when you see a house or a building going up and you see the, 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 the construction folks having blueprints, that's basically what the messenger RNA is. They're, they're about to make a chimney, uh, effectively. Um, but, but the blueprints, you know, eventually fade or they burn or they, they go away. Now, some people uh, have them last longer than others, and some people have reactions to the spike protein uh, that, are, that are different, you know, slightly different different from an immunologic point of view. Now, what I will say is that just like the Black Plague, which happened in 1430, uh, has left a mark in all of all of the people of Western European descent uh, in, in their genetic in, immune system. It's left a mark now six or 700 years later. SARS-CoV-2 is going to leave an immunological mark and a memory in the entire human population for all of time. So this is this is a rem- and and I can't tell you what the consequences of, of that are with with the black plague, uh, it, it it actually can translate as some autoimmune diseases seem to be related to that original encounter where 25 percent of the European population was killed over about a three year period of time. So 600 years later, people are still suffering from the memory of that event. SARS-CoV-2 has the potential to do the same thing over the next thousand years. Well, is it fair to say that the vaccine has the potential to have a similar effect, as you mentioned, that the young boys who got the vaccine and we saw a higher incidence of myocarditis, that those issues could be haunting that part of the population for decades to come? Yes, I'm well. Certainly, all the people who are vaccinated, all the people who got the got SARS-CoV-2, are going to have some aspects of that of that memory in their system, uh, and then it, it also has the potential to be passed on for generations and generations. But yes, uh, unfortunately, about one out of two thousand, one out of fifteen hundred. Uh, you know, typically, boys from about fifteen to twenty-five or thirty. Um, had a had a particular reaction where their heart tissue and the and the spike protein overlapped enough immunologically that they began to attack their own their own uh, heart tissue. Hmm. Uh, that's going to be something that's you know those are those are hard conditions to work through if I can say it that. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting and a little terrifying if you're in that demo or have a child in that demo or a partner in that demo. Those are those are big concerns. Uh, I, I, Mike, there's, I there's, there's something I can tell you, though, though okay. so for your readers. If, the, if someone is really concerned about a 15 to 30-year-old who has this, have them do what is called a, a, a echo stress test. 
if they get on a treadmill or a bicycle and they have EKG set up on their chest or there's an ultrasound on, you know, watching their heart move, if they can get through that exercise, the doctor can tell them, nope, you've got a perfectly normal heart and they're done. You can stop thinking about that. You can go on with your life. So that test will tell you someone who has latent uh, heart problems from this and you can, you know, either then deal with it or you can check it, you know, say it, you know, it's, I, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Very important. So it's not something that will suddenly develop. If you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. That's correct. That's correct. And you can test for it by basically putting a lot of stress on the heart in a laboratory environment, in a hospital environment. Put a lot of stress. Watch the heart move. Does it move properly or not? If it does, you know, you're, you're down to you know, like a 1% chance you could get it with a, with a negative uh, stress test. Well, that's good information. That's that's a little hope out there, and I needed a little hope, Dr. Quay. Dr. Stephen Quay has been our guest. His book, Stay Safe, A Physician's Guide to Survive Coronavirus, with some clarity on this. He comes to us from uh, MIT through uh, uh, Harvard Mass General, where my brother was for quite some time, and Stanford University School of Medicine for almost a decade. Dr. Quay, thanks for your input. Thanks for your knowledge, sir. It is 3.54. This is kind of cool news. There is a uh, a film coming out, a major motion picture, telling the story of Ronald Reagan. Not that we don't know the story of Ronald Reagan, but this is going to be done in a big way. Uh, director Sean McNamara is probably going to join us this week to talk about Dennis Quaid is playing Reagan. And if you've seen the trailers that are online, it looks pretty good. And the other one that I think we should reach out to is uh, Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil is scheduled to do an interview with Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago very soon, apparently. And he's got his own platform, kind of in the way that Tucker Carlson has his own platform. It's not on a traditional streaming service, but it's out there, and I think it's doing pretty well. But he's now made a statement today that he wants the lawfare against Donald Trump to stop. Now, not that the Democrats or their cohorts are going to listen to Dr. Phil, but he has a show called Dr. Phil Primetime, and he's calling for an end to all the lawfare prosecutions of President Trump. Hmm. Maybe we'll hear from Dr. Phil this week. That could be interesting. Could be fun. Anyway, I'm just, I'm looking at a couple of the, a couple of the ideas that have been thrown my way from uh, some of the folks. I really am curious about the Reagan film because it will drive the left crazy. And it's a great story of an American success. So that's coming up maybe Thursday or Friday. We'll have Sean on, the director of this film. Uh, he's, he's kind of a, an actual Hollywood presence. I know a lot of us say nobody in Hollywood is fair to people on the right. That's kind of true. <laughs> kind of true. All right, coming up around the corner uh, next hour, we've got Jenny Tear. She's now at the New York Post doing great work on the border. We'll talk more about Biden's border stuff. There were some really interesting things that happened in the hearing today in the House, especially as it relates to what the Democrats were trying to do to diminish the efforts of the Republicans. And it's just like yesterday with Fauci. Remember when I said you could tell which affiliation the questioner was with based on the first 30 seconds of their time? Either they were um, kissing their hindquarters or they were actually asking questions. The kissing of the hindquarters was typically on the Democrat side, and the real questions were coming from Republicans. I like what Thomas Massey did today, congressman from Kentucky, a guy who's a real independent thinker. He had some very interesting questions for uh, Merrick Garland. We'll get into that. And Swalwell was just a total, well, I can't say it. We'll get thrown off the air. It's Michael Pelka in for Vince Colonnese on a Tuesday on WMAL.